This program has been made possible in part by the following sponsors. The Trial Lawyers Association of B.C. The Vancouver Courier Newspaper. My new book about addictions, All the Way Home, Building Recovery That Works. He's already piled up a list of tremendous accomplishments, uh, years with uh, the Canadian Forces in the Navy, and has published uh, uh, several books and parts of other books, uh, as holds a couple of uh, university degrees, uh, is the mother of three children and the grandmother of I don't know how Two. many others. And uh, But this kid is not finished yet. She's about to embark on her latest caper, her biggest, she calls it the mother of all road trips. But it's not just a camp out. It's about something pretty interesting and pretty important. It's called Defining Canada. We'll show you her website in a minute. Her name is Melanie Graham, and thank goodness she's sitting right here so she can explain what all this, what all this means. Melanie, what, what a, a challenge, what fun. Yeah. We have an amazing country. I've traveled to St. John's, Newfoundland and back from Victoria and uh, met some remarkable people Yes. and have been consistently blown away by the absolute beauty of this country. What was the what was the mad itch? Uh, we have to tell people what you're doing. You're 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 you're, you're going to go out there yeah. and and through talking to lots of people and interviewing them and so on, you're going to try to give us a sense of what Canada really thinks it is. Exactly. Uh, one of the buzzwords is Canada. Who do you think you are? Uh huh. Um, one of my little catchphrases, yeah. I guess. So what was what was the itch that that gnawed at you that said I want to do this? This is what this is what I want to dedicate the next couple of years to. Uh, there were a couple of itches. Uh, one was I completed my uh, my MA in international studies and I became an expert, as it were, in a thing called strategic culture. Right. Which is how your environment shapes society. Yes. Um, it's a bit more complicated than that. Yes, very but, complicated. Uh, a publisher asked me if I would do a full book on the thesis. And could I make the focus Canada? So I thought about it, and I thought about my experience in the military, and I thought Canadians really don't know and appreciate who they are. They, they don't really have a clear sense of identity. And this would be a really good opportunity to come up with an inclusive identity that is related directly to the land itself. So so let's, let's leave Canada for a second. Yes. What do you think... Amer do, do Americans, I mean, America is also a, a vast place with regional accents, regional foods, regional musics, right? Yep. All kinds of different tastes. Uh, Britain isn't what it was 100 years ago. You know, Britain is, is uh, overrun with diversity. Uh, uh, you know, cultures clashing into each other in London and in Leeds. Yep. How are, we, how are we different in Canada? Do we have less of a sense, do you think, than those, those two people who affect us so much? I don't think that we have really articulated um, a clear Canadian identity. Uh, I mean, people outside of Canada think that we're nice. Yes. They think we're very polite. Yes. They think we're peacekeepers. That's uh -huh. outdated. Why is that outdated? Afghanistan. Yes, and Afghanistan uh, is one of the books you contributed to. Yes, it is. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, Canada's identity is tied up in, in so many different geographic areas. The U.S. identity is fundamentally tied to an industri industrialization. Yes. The economy is, is based in industry. We have a resource-based economy. We have an agrarian-based economy. We draw from many, many origins. Um, in terms of strategic culture, the land itself determines what the subsistence technology will be, the dominant subsistence technology. Right. In the UK, that would have been predominantly agrarian, land-owning. 
so that power was associated with land ownership. In the U.S., power is associated with ownership of industry. Yes. In the Middle East, power is associated with control of people. There isn't that same sense of land stewardship that you would find in an agrarian-based culture. But look, look at how much, how much we're changing. I, I watched this fascinating interview uh, with uh, Ken Dryden, the, the, the politician and former uh, Montreal Canadian uh, goalie. Uh, and, and he says, you know, what I'm interested in is Canada today, which is very different because following what you just said, sure, when I was a kid growing up in Winnipeg, the prairies were all about grain. You know, and I listened to those reports every day at noon on the radio. Hogs, 2CW, you know, a rise. <laughs> so, you know, and, the, those, and everybody had to listen to that. The West was all about uh, uh, lumber, and, and uh, coal and oil and so on. No longer. No. We're, uh, we're not totally tied to what's in the ground. No, most of our, our population lives very close to the, the Canada-US border. Uh, I think the geographical elements that impact on Canadians in ways that they don't really stop to consider is the fact that we have the longest coastline in the world, but we feel no great compunction to defend it. We have the longest undefended land border in the world. Yes. We're a very trusting people. Uh, I think in many ways we're somewhat naive. And you, and you inserted the word security into that phrase. What did you call it? Strategic environment? Secure, strategic security culture. Yeah. Why did you do that? Because people found it too confusing to just look at strategic culture. It, like, okay, what do you mean by strategic culture? Strategic security culture brings in the whole notion of what constitutes a threat or an opportunity to your subsistence. So in Canada, uh, one of the things that benefits us is communication and transportation. We're a very large country. Uh, we have to get the resources that we have from point A to point B. So our very openness is both an opportunity and a challenge and yet our country was defined by the railway, by our maritime. Um. And I think to this date, Melanie, I think per capita we have the highest usage of phones of yes. any kind, cell yes. phones, landlines, the highest usage of phones in long distance of anyone in the world. And we pay the most for it too. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we yak and we pack. Yeah. Okay, so what will you actually do? You, you, you've started this process. Yes. I, I know you, you created a Kickstarter campaign. You're trying to raise some money. Yes. Because this won't be cheap. Tell no. the folks what you're going to do. You're going to walk? You're going to bicycle? <laughs> what are you going to do? I have uh, swapped my lovely little Ford Escape for a Grand Caravan. Yes. So that I can actually sleep and live in my vehicle and yes. travel. This summer will be devoted to developmental research in fine-tuning through questions and interviews, what should go into an online survey that I will make available through social media and through my website. Right. Um, I need to find a way to get Canadians to think about what it is that defines them. Um, we, we all derive our sense of identity from our relationships, first with our family, then with our friends, then with a partner, a spouse, with our community around us. Um, and at some point in time, we make that connection with the nation state that we call yes. home. And having that strong sense of identity, I think, gives us um, a clearer vision of what our policies ought to be, what our values are, what we're willing to stand up for, and what we're willing to pass on. But if you don't have that fundamental sense of identity as an individual, as a community, as a nation, it's difficult to have the kind of tolerance that, that you need because if you don't understand yourself, how can you understand someone else? Uh, exactly. Here's one of the things I'd like you to try and find out in that first foray into just BC and Alberta. That's, that'll mm -hmm. be your first few steps, yes. right? There's a, a very odd specific difference between these two provinces. One is that in BC, most of us just seem to take BC for granted yes. to be the most beautiful place in the world. It's just fabulous, right? But in Alberta, every second person you run into, and I've lived there twice, is always telling you how fabulous Alberta is. Yep. What is that about? I, I still don't get that. 
I didn't get it when I lived there. Um, yeah. I was based out of Edmonton for four years. Yes. And um, everybody that I knew who was born and raised there thought that the prairies were fantastic. They were wonderful. They were beautiful. They were yes. all these great things. Yeah. And that's good. But yeah. part of that, I think, is because their, their historical identity was tied to that geography. Um, so there's pride of place, pride of community, pride of skills. And the skills that people develop are tied to the geography that shapes them. Yeah, there, there's no question that, I mean, when I was a kid growing up in Winnipeg, I, I remember with great pride being able to say, you know, we have the largest railway yards in the world, uh, forgetting that maybe Chicago's were bigger. I, I, I was never quite sure of that. But we, that's what we felt. And, and this was the gateway to the West, whatever that meant. But we had this sense of, wow, there's something about this. In fact, it was not a very big city. It's not a very yeah. big city, but yeah. that pride of place, of being yes. at that nexus of river and rail and highway. Exactly. Uh, persists today. Um, I was visiting a friend there. She's working on her PhD in sociology. Yes. And we played tourist for the week that I was visiting her. And that, that sense of Winnipeg is like at that nexus of everything. Yes. Every area has its unique sense of place, of identity. But I'm looking for common themes that will string all these little communities together like pearls on a necklace. But didn't, didn't the CFL screw that up by putting the bombers in the Eastern Division? <laughs> and, and how would you like to live in Cleveland, which according to the morning sports page, hasn't had a team win anything win a championship on, on any surface for something like 174 years. <laughs> well, I think that's a whole different culture that yes. people who follow sports and self-identify through sports. Yes. We all look for something to belong to. Absolutely. Uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is, is a wonderful example. You go through basic subsistence, day-to-day, hand-to-mouth survival, up through uh, safety and security to a sense of belonging. And if you don't have that sense of belonging somewhere, it's very difficult to move on to self-actualization, to productivity, to creativity. When you're a jet, you're a jet all the way from your first cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> Melody Graham, uh, we're going to take a little break, and you're going to tell us more about this trip and how you plan to... It's going to take you about two years, isn't it? No, I can do it a little faster than that. Okay. Uh, you're getting a scooter, are you? Uh, Melody Graham is our guest, and she's about to take off on an extraordinary trip trying to find out what makes us tick and who we really are here in Canada. Uh, good time for us to catch our breath and opportunity for you to send us a note here at davidburner.com. By the way, we got so much hate mail about Pam McCall's visit about marijuana. It was unbelievable. People just off their rockers, angry at us. It was fabulous, it was terribly funny. Uh, also an opportunity for uh, those lovely people who are our sponsors to say hello here on Shaw Community Television Cable 4, back in a sec. This program has been made possible in part by the following sponsors. The Trial Lawyers Association of BC. Vancouver Courier Newspaper. My new book about addictions, All the Way Home, Building Recovery That Works. A friend of mine who's a kind of world citizen, he speaks, uh, I don't know how many, seven languages, uh, has homes in a number of different countries. He constantly is saying to me whenever we have the chance to get together, never forget, David, that Canada is a B movie. <laughs> well, <laughs> are we really, Melody Graham? Is that who we are? Are we, are we perpetually to be stuck between the UK and America? I think so, uh, until we basically take our identity in hand and do something about it. If you look at just the structure of, of our government, um, the prime minister is the head of government. He is not the head of state. 
Right. The queen is the head of state right. through her proxy, the yes. governor general. Um, to me, that means that we are still functionally a colony. And I think that mindset is very pervasive. Um, it explains why our military has a feast or famine existence, because there is a belief that someone will come to our rescue. No one will hurt Canada. Um, everybody likes us. We're so nice. Well, that unguarded border you spoke of yes. uh, is is a frozen wasteland, and it's all chopped up. You know, it's not a clean border. It's no. it's, it's floating around out there, and it's like a zillion degrees below zero, and ships get lost there. So I guess we feel, well, who's going to attack from there? There, there is that complacency, that yes. that uh, I think naivete um, yes. about Canada's security. I don't think that we need to become vehemently afraid and put up walls and do all that sort of thing, but I think we take the bounty that we have and the security that we have very much for granted. And, um, and we do, I, we, we must secretly believe in our heart of hearts that if anything bad happens here, the Yanks will rescue us. There is that belief. I've yes. also encountered uh, the belief. I was stopped at a gas station one time driving through the Rockies and I had a bumper sticker that said Navy, and the guy pumping gas, back when people still pump gas, yes. said, does the Navy own the van? And I said, no, the Navy owns me, I own the van. Uh -huh. And he said, I don't see why we have a military. Look around you, look how beautiful this place is. Why do we need a military? And I just thought, I'm not gonna go there. Yeah, no, you can't go, you, you, you can't go there. Do you, do you believe that we are, uh, by the way, I'm glad you mentioned the word colony because it, it struck me when you used it in your writing. Uh, on your website, because uh, I know that for many, many years, until very recently, I felt that in literature, in theater, and in music, and architecture, we were a colonial culture. Yes. And probably in other ways, in business, I don't know. I'm, I'm not much of a businessman, but certainly in the arts, I felt for a long time, when I first moved to Vancouver, every actor, you know, spoke like this. It's like, are you people kidding? Haven't you heard of Tennessee Williams? What's going on here? Yes, and they're all now trying to get big ticket jobs down in Hollywood as opposed to Hollywood North. We're sort of like a transition point. And we're really not very good at creating internal stars. Some they of the leave. They all leave. <laughs> they all leave, but then, you know, we, we do goofy things like we create a star out of a second-rate player like Evan Solomon, and we're surprised when he gets fired. Who's, who besides the 17 people who watch the CBC even know who he is? Exactly. <laughs> well, do, you, do, you have, do you feel that you have to shed some prejudices of your own as you go out to try to openly find out what Canadians think? I think we all have built-in prejudices. Um, I have a very different background. My mother grew up in Japan, my father in India, and wow. my formative years were spent in West Africa and Pakistan when it was still West Pakistan. Um, yes. Took up permanent residence in Canada when I was five, but a lot of that formative sense of, of who I was was strongly influenced by being in different environments. And it's left me quite open to discovery as I've traveled through Canada. I've lived in New Brunswick, Quebec, Ontario, Alberta, and BC. Well, the, the, you see, there are five very different yep. environments. Somebody just spoke to me the other day over coffee about Quebec being on another planet. And that, in, it and, feels like that sometimes. And yeah. it does sometimes feel like that. As beautiful as it is, as wonderful as it is, as rich as the, the culture and the music and the food, blah, blah, still it really feels like you, you've entered another zone entirely. Well, it's even more so when you go to Newfoundland. I, I've been to Newfoundland, yes. They have the longest Tim Hortons lineups in Canada, not because there's a lot of people, but because everybody has to talk to the clerk at the counter because they all know each other. Yes. And so there's that, how are you doing? How's by you? How's the family? Yes. Um, so it was interesting. Warm, friendly, gracious yep. people. I spent a month there doing a job uh, many years ago. Loved every second. I expected to hate it. Loved every moment. There's some beautiful parts of Newfoundland, but something I noticed traveling through it was there are no farms. I didn't know that. I never left the city. Yeah, I traveled yes. all around the rock. Yeah. And the geography does not support farming. All the food has to be imported unless you can't fish. Yeah. 
uh, and a lot of the fish aren't there anymore. Uh, what are you going to do with all this material? You're going to collect a bunch of stuff. You're going to yep. collect stuff on video, on audio, mm -hmm. uh, on, in notebooks. Uh, you're hoping for many different kinds of exposures. You're hoping yes. for exposure on a number of different platforms. Yes. Uh, describe. Uh, I have a producer interested in taking all of the film footage and turning it into a documentary. Yes, and, good. Um, we're also discussing the possibility of doing a little reality blog while I'm traveling. Yep. Um, the publisher that I'm working with uh, is partnering with a um, French publisher so that we can capture the bilingual aspect. Right. Um, he's interested in both a print book and an e-book. And the website itself is going to, I'm going to start accumulating information on Canadian trivia. Uh, I've got two interviews at the website now. Um, I'm inviting people to send in selfie interviews so they can go to the Facebook page, which is linked to the website. Um, take your little iPhone or Android, your smartphone, and hold it up and tell me what it means to you to be a Canadian, and then send it to me. Let me throw a couple of words at you and mm -hmm. just get, get your reaction. Tradition. Tradition is uh, a part of where our core values come from, but if we become hidebound in tradition, uh, we're not open to where that tradition can lead us in terms of evolving and capitalizing on the strengths of the tradition to move in new directions. And we're a very different model from America. Yes. America is uh, the quilt. Everybody becomes uh, an American right away. And, and we are a multicultural thing. We're, you know, we, we, we welcome everybody and, and hang on to your culture and let's celebrate your celebrations. And so it's a very different environment. Well, the U.S. is very much a melting pot. Yes. When you come to the U.S., you become an American. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In Canada, we're all hyphenated Canadians. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, my ancestry derives from Northern Europe and the British Isles. Right. But by virtue of my coloring and my personality, I feel that I have the greatest affinity with my Scottish heritage. So does that make me a Scottish Canadian? Don't know, but it still resonates as a part of who I am. So we're all hyphenated Canadians. Where's your voice from? I can't place your voice. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> because it, 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 it's an unusual voice. And it's not American, no. Nope. But but it has a different sort of timber to it. It's got a bit of the Maritimes in it. Uh huh. Um, it would have a little bit of Quebec in it. Yes. Uh, I used to speak French, but then people would start speaking very rapidly in Joao, and I would get completely <laughs> lost. So I no longer. <laughs> Good luck. I'll, I'll work on that. I'll work on that. Uh, um, being in BC, uh, we're such a, an eclectic mix in Vancouver. What What do you think about our levels of productivity? There are many of us who, f who complain regularly that, that we're just not making enough things and selling enough things. Um, I think that we need to make more room and time in our lives for individual creative productivity and become less obsessed with consumerism. Uh -huh. um, yes, it's good to have industry. Yes, it's, it's good to capitalize on the resources that are available to you, but I think we have a lot of untapped potential in terms of the creative human resources, especially in the cultural diversity that is Canada. So I... And so you would be cheered, according to what you just said, you would be cheered by the kinds of little pockets of artisanship that we see in the Gulf Islands and that we see in some of the suburban and rural areas where yep. we see lots of people making things and yep. creating their own jams and jellies or whatever. Yeah, it would be nice to see more of that in, in urban areas as well. I have a daughter-in-law who's a weaver, very talented, uh -huh. and I have a son who's a carpenter by day and a musician by night. Uh, I have another son who's a chef, a sous chef, but yes. he loves to cook. He'll come over to my house and attack my kitchen and Boy, did you do good planning as a parent. <laughs> you've, got, you've got kids who are going to feed you, house you, and clothe you. I mean, this is good planning. I have a daughter who's doing her Bachelor of Commerce in uh, business communication. So, <laughs> so, so you're, you cleverly will be taken care of. Yeah. Uh, well, actually, I told my youngest son that I'm moving in at some point. He have have like, you set out? We have two minutes left, Melanie. Mm -hmm. uh, Graham, have, have you started this trip, I, I get the feeling that you, you've done a lot of the organizing, 
Yes. When do you actually hit the road? I'm heading over to Vancouver Island on Friday. Okay. Um, I've got a few interviews set up on the island uh, with people that I know and friends of friends. Yes. Um, if, if the Kickstarter project doesn't come through with the funding, I will use what I gather on this next leg of the journey to start drawing up my proposals for corporate sponsorship, federal grants, so on and so forth. And I, I looked at your whole program and I looked at your budget and the first thought that occurred to me was you need one serious angel. Yes. You need one rich guy who will say, Melanie, here's 200 large, go, go to it. I should make it 300 large. Okay, 300 yeah. large. <laughs> As long as I'm spending his money, yeah. Well, there's, but there's a lot that will come back from it in terms of final Absolutely. product. Um, to have the book ready, to have the film ready, to have all of this ready for our 150th birthday would be really quite spectacular. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, you yourself it. say it's important to communicate, to act, and to change. So I am a trained communicator. I am acting on my desire to communicate, and I hope to... Create you're, change. you're quoting my website. That's right. <laughs> Communication, action, change. Melly, thanks so much, and best thank of you. luck. I'm going to follow you, Define Defining Canada. I'll follow your progress. Well, thank you. Give I'll drop you an email once in a while. Please, please do that. Okay, thank okay. you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. So that's it, folks, for uh, today. Uh, next week, Wilbur Kelsick has been involved in the highest level of sports worldwide. At the moment, he's in Greece uh, for many years. So when the FIFA story broke, he went yawn. Like, what took it so long? Because he believes that corruption at the highest levels of sports is basic. We'll see next week. Thanks for being here on Shaw Community Television Cable 4. Good evening. <laughs>